Welcome to worship as the First Baptist Church of Worcester, a familiar setting for us in some ways, but all indications from various forecasts were that, that this period of time, Sunday morning, was going to be too treacherous for most people to come in person. So we put our heads together trying to think of how we could still get a service in place for everybody from home. So I think we came up with a, a, a pretty good idea here. I think so. We were able to tap in a couple of people to help us with the service. The organist for today will be Barkley Wood. And preaching the sermon will be the Reverend Michael Scroggin. We hope that you are able to enjoy and also worship along with, well, some of you yourselves, but our friends from 1987, that Christmas season in December. Happy Epiphany. children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. John bore witness to him and cried, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me for he was before me. And from his fullness have we all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only Son who is in the bosom of the Father. He has made him known. Thus ends this morning's scripture lesson.
Well, it's right on us now, this season of resolutions. We make them every year about this time, things that we're going to change in the year ahead. Some of them are personal and have to do with being overweight or working too hard or not working hard enough. Many of them are not as personal as that. Sometimes it has to do with business ventures we're involved in. This is the season of the year for calculating out what our taxes are going to be and for making the adjustments that have to be made before the year end if the taxes are to be the minimum, which is what we'd like them to be, of course. And it's a time for setting projections, for coming up with our own forecasts for what our efforts and behavior can generate in the year ahead. All this is necessary, even if sometimes it's frustrating and doesn't work out according to plan. Human beings are planning animals. We, we do it automatically. We couldn't possibly be rid of it. But I think in the midst of all these plans and calculations and resolutions, this is a good time of year to remind ourselves that there is another equally valid way to look at life, maybe even a more valid way to look at life, because life is not only the setting and accomplishing of plans, though that is an important part of it. Life is to a great degree what happens that we do not expect, what happens that is unplanned for. Perhaps, well, certainly, these are the most important ventures in life how we respond to what takes us by surprise, to what happens in between our plans, to what is unprepared for. There's great value, there's spiritual value in learning how to deal with this uncalculated side of life, how to deal with it as a gift rather than as a terror, how to take the surprises that come to us as something that we can grow with and learn from as opposed to a mere disruption. This particular season of the year, of course, in addition to talking about resolutions, we're close enough to Christmas still that we remember the Incarnation. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. That's the way John puts this idea of Incarnation. Now, I know Incarnation is not a word that you use in everyday speech. It's an old Christian theological word. It has to do with, as John put it, the Word becoming flesh, becoming a human being in the person of Jesus Christ. The other Gospels tell the story a little differently. Matthew and Luke in particular, they tell a birth story about how Christ was born at Bethlehem, how this God who had created the earth now becomes human in this particular individual human being, this infant, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, it's a strange idea to talk about a God, some eternal, almighty being showing up in the person of any human individual, least of all in some impoverished baby born in a backwater like Bethlehem. It's a strange idea, and in the modern world, I suppose there are some people who look upon it as a quaint old superstition, useful for people in ancient days, but one that is so far-fetched today, it's hard to see any use for us. But I'd like to ask this morning, what does or what can that notion of the incarnation, of God becoming flesh, what could it mean for us? I'm not convinced it's so outmoded and old-fashioned, it's absolutely useless. William Carlos Williams was one of the great poets of this century. He was also a physician, lived and worked in Patterson, New Jersey, often writing his poems late at night after he'd gotten home from his rounds he served the poor, for the most part, the poor in Patterson, hiking up and down the stairs of the tenements where they lived. And often it was, his, it was the encounter he would have with individual people in their tenements that would stick with him, would stay in his mind as he drove his car back to his house. And then, rather than go to sleep, he would write down what it was that had visited him, what it was that had taken hold of him in his travels, in his medical journeys, and his poetry was born out of that experience. One of William Carlos Williams' famous quotes is this, that there are no ideas but in things. No ideas but in things. Another strange sounding phrase, but it grew up out of his work. Williams had been trained in the liberal arts. He understood philosophy. He had a lively mind. He liked to think about ideas, to play with them. 
But what he'd learned as a physician was that the mere thinking about ideas didn't really accomplish anything. That what really made a difference was the physical acts. What happened to the person before him, that sick person who had a problem in his or her body? What change took place there? What healing took place? And regularly he found in his work with sick people that when the phone call would come and he would try to respond over the telephone, offering a calming voice and some reassurance about an office visit the next day, that that might temporarily make a person rest and make them feel better. But what really brought about the healing was not only his medical skill, but his, his personal skill, his going to that person's home and the taking of a pulse or the listening to the exact nature of the complaints, the looking in the eye. What Williams meant when he said there are no ideas but in things was that healing happened in real events. He means, in some ways, the same thing that John means when John talks about the Word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. Part of what William Carlos Williams tried to do as a doctor and tried to write about as a poet was that very business of incarnation, of bringing healing physically, face to face, and hand to hand to people who he contacted. Williams is not the only poet who talks about this idea of incarnation. It's there in many of our great writers and poets. William Butler Yeats, the Irish poet and essayist who won the Nobel Prize in the early portion of this century, said the, these words at one point, God guard me from thoughts men think in their minds alone. Yeats, too, was suspicious of mere ideas. Things needed to be lived out to make sense to be demonstrably lived out so that people would know what ideas we stood for and what we lived by. He went on to say at another point, we only believe in those thoughts which have been conceived not in the brain but in the whole body. That's what incarnation is about. It's the ideas that take hold of us so strongly, so powerfully, that they change the way we live, that one could decipher our mind from seeing what we do with our bodies from how we behave ourselves and how we care for other people. Now, I know that can, can still sound a bit strange, particularly in churches. We don't talk about bodies very much. We're a little more at ease talking about ideas and beliefs and scripture. But the incarnation wants to lay hold of your body. That's what the message from John is about. That's what happened in that first century. It's also what happens right down into our own time. The changing, transforming power of God wants to get hold of you. It's interesting, you know, we see this when we stop and think about it and don't think of it as a strange phenomenon, but as normal. We can also see it in a variety of other ways. Any of us who have raised children, in particular who have raised them from infancy, know what happens to us physically when we hear our child cry. Because it doesn't take very long. It doesn't take more than perhaps a few days or a week or two until you reach the point where you can tell the difference between your child's cry and somebody else's child's cry. And it doesn't take very much longer or very long at all before you can tell the difference between your child's cry that is normal and not at all to be responded to in panic and the kind of cry that terrifies you, that brings you from a sound sleep out of your bed onto your feet and running to find out what the problem is. All of us have, at some point, understood that by our very bodies. We felt that chill inside ourselves when the cry went wrong and when immediate attention was needed. There are no ideas but in things. God save us from those thoughts that are thought only in the mind. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's not that strange when we think about it because we've really experienced it, some of us. We've experienced it in ordinary ways, or we've seen people who've experienced it. If you've ever seen a, a dancer, a really dedicated dancer, one who's trained and excellent, if you've ever seen them respond to music, sometimes even when they're not supposed to dance, how often they can't help but move their body in time. The stories told of George Balanchine, the, the famous, the, the late and famous choreographer and, and ballet dancer who founded the New York City Ballet. The stories told that when he would direct Peter Marins, his principal dancer, that Balanchine himself could not sit still. 
he was so involved with the music. Something had laid hold of him. Something inhabited his body and made him act differently. Even though he was not supposed to dance, he would move in his chair. He was almost physically up there with Marin's. We see it in a variety of ways. If you've ever seen a gardener, I mean a good gardener, not just a gardener like me who grows a few tomatoes and a lot of weeds. I mean a gardener who knows what he or she is doing. If you've seen such a person go into another individual's garden where there are beautiful flowers or beautiful plants and vegetables, they don't tour gardens like I do. I go through and I find the path and walk and look and pretty soon I'm through. But a real gardener will be down on his or her knees and the hands will be down in the soil and they'll be breaking it apart, rubbing it between their fingers and asking all sorts of questions. Do you use bone meal? Do you mulch? What kind of fertilizer do you add? Do you use pesticides? They're involved. There's something has laid hold of them, not only up here, but in their arms and in their hands. They're involved with that garden. The word became flesh in them in some strange fashion. You can see it in a variety of ways. Carl Sandburg started his career as a newspaper man on the Chicago Tribune. Actually, I guess it was the Daily News, according to, to Sandberg's biography. And Sandberg remembers the time when, as a sports writer, he was assigned to go out and ask Babe Ruth some questions. So Sandberg started his interview this way. People come up and ask you, Babe, don't they? What's your system for hitting home runs? Yes, said the Babe, and all I can tell him is I pick a good one and I sock it. I get back to the dugout and they ask me what it was I hit, and I tell them, I don't know, except it looked good. The babe didn't have a system. What the babe had was incarnation. Something had laid hold of him. It wasn't an idea in his mind. It was some kind of ability that ran, ran through his entire body that allowed him to hit home runs like nobody else before him. <coughs> Philip Petit, you remember him? My name's not famous, but you'll remember what he did. He was the guy who illegally walked between the two towers of the World Trade Center sneaked up there along with an accomplice in the dark of night, used a crossbow to fire a wire across from one tower to the other, and the accomplice on the other tower then anchored it. They tightened the wire, and Philip Petit got up using a balance pole and walked the high wire there, what, 140 stories or more above the streets of New York City. He was arrested when he got across. And to the judge, he explained why he did this sort of thing. His explanation had nothing to do with the legalities or illegalities of it. Philip Petit simply said, Your Honor, when I see three balls, I have to juggle. When I see two towers, I have to walk. Philip Petit understood what the incarnation was about. It didn't have to do with an idea in his mind. It had to do with something that had been thought out in his body. It had to do with behavior. The incarnation is not just an old idea trapped in the distant past. It is something for us today. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And we Christians believe that the Word is still in the process of trying to become flesh and dwell among us, not in some totally mysterious way, impossible to understand, but in our daily lives. It's a season of calculations, of plans, and of projections, of making forecasts and trying to, to live up to them to make them work out. But my suggestion this morning would be in the midst of all that planning, it would be wise for us to leave some room. To leave some room for the surprises that will come. To leave some room to be visited by incarnation. For it still comes, it still surprises. We are not left, finally, to rely only on our own strength. And that, perhaps, is the best news of all about the incarnation. That there is a God who comes to us in the midst of our difficulties that there is a God who we have not been able to plan for and never will be able to plan for. But when the chips are down and we are in real trouble, that God comes. E.L. Doctorow, in his book, the recent one called World's Fair, has a, uh, the main character is named David, and he, the story starts out with David as a young boy. The crisis in David's early life is an illness. His appendix ruptures and he is taken to the hospital and his life hangs in the balance. His parents are, are deeply concerned. But David begins slowly to recover. He has to battle off fevers. He goes through night sweats. 
But slowly as he recovers, his parents' concern eases a little. Then something happens that very much reassures David, but terrifies his parents. He has a visit from his grandmother. His grandmother, however, is dead. The visit takes place like this. This is the way, at least, that David remembers it. She's come to the hospital. She walked through the curtain, says David. So she hadn't died after all. I was glad the curtains around my bed were pulled because none of the others could see her. She embarrassed me speaking in Yiddish and looking very old and shabby in her black dress and with her gray hair pinned up in her braids but scraggly around the edges. She was not as neat as she usually was and she smelled of her sour grass. But I was thirsty and explained to her how to do the water and she did this properly. Then she felt my head with her dry ancient hand and she thought I was too hot. She found a washcloth at the foot of my bed and went outside the curtains to the sink along the wall and rinsed the cloth in cold water and came back and put the folded cloth over my forehead. You are a dear precious boy, she said to me. And I understood this clearly even though it was in Yiddish. She took a penny from her old change purse of cracked leather. In her forefinger and thumb, she held this penny and with her other hand opened my hand and pressed the penny into my palm just the way she always did. I bless you, my beloved child. I pray good health for you. You are a good boy, and I love you, and God will protect you. And then she left. And when David told his parents about the story, they were sure that he was hallucinating, that this was some kind of terrible omen that he would grow more ill, maybe even die. But he didn't. He recovered. David was surprised by the visit from his grandmother. It was something no one could possibly have planned for. Oh, it's only work of fiction, I know that. You shouldn't believe it, it's true. But perhaps, perhaps in the midst of our plans and calculations, we ought to hold open the possibility that such visitations are true. I don't mean from ghosts, I mean from God. I mean that that healing power of God that was present in Jesus Christ at the very beginning is still alive and active today in such a way that we cannot forecast its activity and we cannot forclude its presence in our lives. We need to leave room for surprises. For the surprises will come and if we learn that they can be from God, we may also learn that they need not terrify us. They can be blessings even as that visit David experienced was a blessing. We make plans at this time of year, but if we'd understand the incarnation, it's important that we not let our plans or our calculations or our successes rule out our need for help. One of the great dangers, I think, particularly for successful people, <coughs> excuse me, is to, ex to assume that we don't need help, that we're somehow beyond the need for it. We've, we've reached a point where we can do it on our own. And indeed, that's a great deal of the message that goes on all around us, that we're, we're somehow perversely supposed to reach this point. It's endlessly there on the advertisements on television to, to reach such a point of invulnerability and success and wealth that you don't need anything from anybody. But that's impossible, of course. And it's also a very ugly goal to set for oneself. Far better to learn that we are constantly in need and to be ready to receive the help that comes that's offered on a regular basis. I've mentioned before Primo Levi. I've talked about him a number of times, the great Italian writer. I haven't told the whole story there, not that the whole story could ever be told, but one important aspect I have left out, a tragic as aspect. Primo Levi, you'll recall, was a survivor of Auschwitz and wrote the book entitled Survival in Auschwitz, and then a number of other books, two different kinds, a series of novels and a series of memoirs, recollections about his year in the camp in Auschwitz itself. He became, in the course of his writing, an extremely successful author, widely recognized. He also had a second career right alongside that. In addition to his writing, he ran a major chemical plant, a paint plant in Turin, and made a significant amount of money. He had a family, he had children. Last spring, Primo Levi, at the height of his powers, took his own life. Somehow or other, 
despite all he had been able to accomplish, despite his ability, apparently, to overcome that initial crippling experience in Auschwitz, when the chips were down, life didn't mean enough. He lost faith, or maybe that's the wrong way to put it, because Levy was not a religious man. But interestingly, he has left us a testament about these last days of his life, about what was going on in his mind. The testament has recently begun, begun to come out in magazines, and a recent portion was published under the title, Shame. For that was what Levy had begun to feel. He explains that for a number of years, for decades, he had been able to reconcile his survival in Auschwitz with some theories, if you will. The first was the well-known survivor theory. That, that theory put much over simply is that there are some of us who are naturally survivors, that given a crisis, some of us will come through, but the majority of us will fall away, will die or quit or whatever. That was helpful to Levy for a while, the sense that maybe there was some inborn quality in him that he didn't have to earn or deserve that had allowed him to survive. The other thing, the other aspect that helped Levy make sense of his survival and give meaning to his life was that there was a story to tell. And indeed there was, as many have told, a story of, of the Nazis and the death camps, the terrible genocide that came out of all that. But there came a point in Levy's life when the story was no longer there to be told. It had been told. He had told all he knew of it. And when that point came, he began to wonder, what next? Maybe he was a survivor. But what was the purpose of his life now? And that was the thread, you see, that had been lost at the age of 67. Why would a man take his life? a man who was a success, who was at the top of his powers, apparently because there was nothing else to do, no new challenge, no new story to recount. What Levy needed desperately is the same thing all of us need, perhaps not to the same intense degree he needed it, but what he needed was the power of the incarnation, some surprise that could come into his life that could refocus him and show him that life didn't end just because the story had been told. Is that something you need in your life today? Many of us run into periods where we say, well, I've accomplished it all. That's all there is. There's nothing left for me to do. We don't necessarily commit suicide, but we die a little bit when we reach that point. The message of Christmas, of this season of the year, is that when you least expect it, something brand new and startling and powerful can be born in you. We make our plans, but let us in the midst of our making plans remember and leave room for surprise. And let us never assume that despite, that, it, that because of our success and strength and power, we are beyond needing God's help. 